Hi, I'm Paul Germain. Welcome to another session of Smart Boating. As you know, if you watched the show before, we cover a wide variety of topics, from man overboard to marine insurance. And the general idea is to provide you with some information to help you make smarter decisions and have more fun on the water. Today's show is going to be uh, down a slightly different route, and we're going to look at the world of plastic boat restoration. And specifically, we're going to talk about the restoration of a, a vintage Italian speedboat called Arriva. And joining us is an expert in that area. His name is Bjorn Bucken, and he sits on the International Directors Board of the ACBS. Welcome, Bjorn. Thank you, Paul. Good to have you back. Thank you very much. Yep. Uh, we got a great show here today. People are going to really enjoy it. Uh, but before we get into it, can you share with them a little bit about your boating background, wood building background, and maybe ACBS? Sure. So I am. Um... I'm, I'm a woodworker by trade and uh, I've been interested in classic wooden boats since I was young. Mm -hmm. uh, Fifteen years ago I got into the hobby by restoring classic uh, mahogany boats. Okay. Uh, currently sit on the international board of the Antique and Classic Boat Society, which is an interest organization for uh, any boats 25 years and older mm -hmm. and uh, to care and use the vintage boat. Um, also. Uh, the charter of the ACBS is to, you know, uh, protect the history of the classic boat to make sure that historical boats uh, from the beginning of uh, motor boating in the 19 teens mm -hmm. uh, are held to a high standard that we keep the history, preserve the history uh, of these uh, this, uh, fine vessels. Wow, that's neat. Well, you've got just the right experience for the show today, so why don't we get right into it? Sounds good, thank you. Okay. Well, Bjorn, in this area of boat restoration and refurbishment. Uh, I guess it, there's a lot of points to cover. We can't cover them all, but we'll cover some of the key ones today. Yep. And I guess it would, the process would start on selecting a boat to, 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 to go through this process with. How did you decide on the boat that you restored? So I, I decided on um, restoring a Riva because of the exclusivity of Riva. Um, only three and a half thousand would Riva boats has ever been built. Mm -hmm. um, Chris Craft made 3,000 of one model in oh, just okay. a few years. Okay. Uh, so the important with Riva is that you, uh, or any classic boat restoration, is that you, you, you know that you're starting with a real project. Yes. Um, all the Mark Club, the Chris Craft Antique Boat Club, Century, Riva Historic, they can all help you authentic, authenticate oh, a okay. boat. And they often give you a certificate uh, that the boat is, uh, it is what it is. It is genuine. It yeah, is it's genuine, authentic. yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Riva is an exclusive boat. It was built mm -hmm. a few and uh, so something I always wanted to, to really work on and try, yeah. try my best at. How about this specific model that you chose? What was it? What year is it? And what's the length? And what's the, what's the model? Why did you pick this one? So it is a, a Riva Ariston. It's a 1955. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a model uh, named Ariston was used from 1952 to 1977. Okay. They built several dis different versions of it. Yeah. Uh, this is an early one, a very early one. And of the 136 uh, built in mm -hmm. this series, only 18 remains in the world. Wow. So I really want to yeah. uh, have something that was special. That's uh, a very rare bird. Now, now, this is some of the original wood that you started with, right? Yes. Yeah, so this was project was a very big project, mm -hmm. uh, probably the, one of the biggest restoration projects taking on. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's, it was borderline not, you know, it was <laughs> a, a pile of wood that you measure from. Right. So when you do, uh, you, you have all the old parts, you okay. know, all the old yeah. frames, you reconstruct it. Right. Uh, you know, this is one of the old bottom frames and side frames okay. of this boat. Yeah. Uh, and then you have to source materials. Well, you have to, uh, you got to source the materials, but you also have to have a drawing to follow as, you, as you're going to reconstruct it, right? That's right. And uh, we've got one here. Yep. And so, maybe you can point out. Yes. Some of the things that are particularly important about a drawing well, like this. Yeah, you know, with, with a Riva or any boat, it's important to have the proportions right. You know, yeah. you, you have to have the framing, spacing. Um, this drawing is for a newer model Riva, uh, but mm -hmm. it will give you an insight in the construction methods and, and, and things like that. Yeah. And, uh, in my case, the Riva Historical Society has been very helpful uh, with information. Uh, I have seen... Um, uh, I have a picture of six 
uh, of the early Rivas. I have two and a half thousand pictures wow. of existing boats. So it really, uh, there's a small community. Everybody want to help out and so you get the right details. Big help, um, yeah. Yeah, and so, do it right. All right, yeah. so you get a start with the old pieces. Yeah. And then you've got some support in terms of what it's, what the dimensions are. And then yep. you've got to get the materials now. These aren't these aren't ordinary materials. I mean, you can't go down to the local building center and and, and, and get the wood, for example, right? So, this is kind of a this is a project in itself, right? Certainly not uh, lumber yard no. uh, fine. Uh, everything in this boat is uh, mahogany, mm -hmm. uh, African mahogany. African, yeah. Yeah, you can get um, all kinds of African mahogany at you know specialty lumber yards, you know, mm -hmm. uh, around the country. Mm -hmm. uh, but specific for Riva is that it's a very light uh, African mahogany. Okay. Um, and um, uh, with Riva, there's no butt joints in the sides, in the planking. Right, right. You one have to have length. one length the entire boat. Yeah. And, you know, then we're talking about a piece of wood that's 23 feet, 24 feet long. Yeah. And nothing like that is commercially available today. So you have to go maybe to a farm. You have to basically maybe go to Africa to, to source well, the wood and then get it, it cut it, in another place. It's, that's right. It's no so easy you, thing, is it? No, it's not an easy thing. And, <laughs> Uh, I imported my own lumber yeah. uh, from from Germany. Mm -hmm. um, big process. No, I must have called 50 or 60 lumber yards and importers of specialty lumber, and they kind of were laughing at me with my requirements. <laughs> so I had to take the spoon in my own hand, and uh, you know, so I imported the lumber I needed for this boat myself. Wow, yeah. that's, that's an extraordinary thing. And we're gonna talk more about the hardware on the boat and, and the upholstery as we go along yep. and talk about how you source that. That was, again, a certain elements of complexity that aren't in a normal restoration are associated with this particular boat. Certainly not, you know, it was one of 136 built uh, you know, in the early 50s, you know, many doesn't uh, exist anymore. Right. Uh, parts are scarce. Uh, you know, I worked, we can get back to it, but you know, working yeah. on 3D printing metal pieces that we no longer available. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, well, we'll talk more about that later, but uh, you need the old materials, you need the drawings, and you need the materials, and that's where you get to start. That's right, right. and a lot of help from, from a fellow community <laughs> right. that's uh, more than willing to, to let you probe and picture and ask questions and answer questions. Yes. And, and uh, you know, help out with parts that you're missing. And some of these parts are very, very rare, and mm. they kind of go into their collections and you know, give a fellow a, a hand. Get a hand. Yeah. yeah. Nice. Well, Bjorn, you know, restoring a, a classic runabout like a Riva to me it reminds me almost like building a watch. It's so intricate. There's so many pieces. There's so many tight tolerances, and it's interesting how it's built. And I thought we'd start off just briefly telling people about that. And, and you start at what they call turtle. You work on the bottom first, right? Yes, so when you're restoring a boat like this, I, I start uh, upside down. You start with uh, engine stringers. Mm -hmm. You build your frames off your engine stringers. Mm -hmm. uh, you're getting your lines, you're getting your keel in. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, side frames, uh, of course. Uh, the construction of a Riva is very similar to any American built boat, okay. aircraft, uh, garwood, um, you know, century. Yeah. Uh, it's basically yeah. frames uh, that mm -hmm. bottom sides and decks are frame. Okay. Um, you know, on on this one it has a plywood molded plywood bottom, mm -hmm. but an early Riva has planked sides, so it's called a Carvel planking. Okay. Uh, these frame sits on Riva, okay. like 11 inches on center. Yeah. And it has uh, long battens going in these grooves here, yeah, yeah. and that's where the planks meet. Okay. And you, you can screw them in together to, to hold a watertight seal. And again, it's a single plank that goes the length of the boat, Entire right? Entire length on the boat, yeah. There are uh, seven, seven planks on the side of this. Seven planks, okay. Yes, you can see all here. This, oh, this right. is, yeah, right. this is yeah. a plank. This have a support, yeah. And you know, they are maybe just three inches wide in at the stern of this boat, oh, and up to right. seven and a half up round because right. it's very, I call it trumpet shaped or snake shaped. So uh, the complexity there is that you've got the plank changing shape and then you've got the curvature of the hull too, right? Absolutely. So why a plank may seem like level on right. a boat, if right. you take it off and when you get the curvature out, it basically looks like a snake, you know, with a yeah. wide in one end and uh, wow. narrow in the other. And this is uh, intricate and tricky to to, and you, of course, you know, you have to make those seams invisible. Yes, that's, yes, yes. That, that is the key. 
So you worked at very narrow tolerances throughout the boat, from the engine stringers to the planks to the decking, right? Of course, you know, you have to start with the tight tolerances. Uh, if, mm -hmm. if, you, if you start, you know, from the keel and the um, uh, engine stringers yes. up to the framing, yeah. you, you start with, uh, you know, plus minus a sixteenth, because, you know, if you start with more than that, it's <laughs> going to be exponentially more when you get to, to the finished details. Yeah, yes. it multiplies. Yeah. Mul it multiplies itself, yes. Right, right, right. So the end result is, is very uh, sophisticated and lightweight and strong construction, I guess, right? That's right. Carl Riva actually built uh, the boat uh, on jigs. Uh, yeah. mm -hmm. And it said that I had, he had a tolerance of you know, less than a sixteenth yes. down to a millimeter. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, that may be, maybe the jig was that uh, accurate, but yes. you know, we're talking about wood and there's, there's wood movement as well. Right. Uh, he prefabricated all the frames uh, you know, bottom side oh, and right. deck frame yeah. one, yeah. and he assembled them in a jig. Yes, yes. Then he did the sides, then he flipped the boat over and did the bottom. Oh, okay. But, uh, you know, I certainly do not have those jigs, <laughs> so I have to start with the way uh, I know how to do it. Right, Upside right. down, you can, right. you can take measurements and you can get it, you know, get the, get the, get get it get the fairness. Right. Yes, to get right, yeah. Just right, yeah. yeah. Well, Bjorn, when you look at classic and vintage runabouts, on Arriva, one of the things that really stands out, are, well, there are actually two things that come to my mind. One is the decking, and the other is the hardware. Or maybe you could share with us the restoration process of the decking and what was important when you were doing that. Sure. So, um, unless American built boats, um, Carl Arriva put inlays. Uh, there's no caulking in the seams between. Uh, between the planks in the deck, if okay. you will. Okay, okay. Uh, the deck is uh, made up of three different species mm -hmm. of wood. Mm -hmm. In this year, in 1955, it was Sipo uh, on the outside in the center that was stained. Mm -hmm. It was Spanish cedar, uh, the dark wood in the center. Spanish okay. cedar is actually a, a, ma a mahogany, mahogany? It, okay. even though it's called cedar. Yeah. And the inlays, uh, which uh, is uh, a striped wood, either dog fur or a sika spruce okay. uh, of that type. Okay. Um, you, you start with the, you start with the covering boards and the king plank we call in the center. Yeah. And there's two thoughts of laying a deck. Mm -hmm. uh, one is to use pre-make them in panels. Yes. And press them down and form them into um, to to the deck. Right. Uh, and then round out the last outer seam for the inlay. Yeah. I did it differently. I laid the outer seams of the deck first. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and and then laid four and four strakes and pressured them down, bagged them down, and I did four and four on each side, uh, each day front and back, uh, so I could get the right curvature oh, of the deck I because see. it's it's a three-dimensional shape. And laying a piece of plywood down in three-dimensional shape is very difficult yes. without getting a, a peak or something I like that. I see what that. you're saying. Yeah. yeah. And for Carl Riva, uh, I think um, all the details mattered for Carl Riva. Mm -hmm. He, even the decks, uh, the inlays are four millimeter. You know, it's all metric yeah. boat built in Europe. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, and the mahogany stakes, strakes are 32 millimeter. And if you add it up, four, eight, sixteen, thirty-two, it's all. In proportionate to nothing is not thought of right. when it's coming to color. That's Colorado. impressive. Yeah. Well, we're going to talk about the hardware in a second, but I want to stay with the deck just a little while longer because the varnish, its application, and the amount of coats and that whole process is a very big deal on these reels, right? It, it is. It's uh, you know it was not necessarily a mass-produced boat. Um, it's known that Chris Craft went uh, went out of the shop with four coats of varnish. Mm -hmm. uh, Riva certainly did not do that. Uh, they were all buffed. Um, I'm not quite sure how many coats uh, mm -hmm. they did go out with. Mm -hmm. uh, 10, 12, something like that. Uh, this boat, of course, when we restored them today, we, we put more coats on. This boat has 24 coats on. Wow. But that being said, you know, you want an even surface. So 75% of those 24 coats are sanded, sanded, off. sanded off. Yes. Right. right. Yep. Well, it came out beautiful. Now, the hardware looks really nice too, and a lot of this hardware was originally made at the factory, right? That's right. He yeah. uh, he had his own plating uh, business on um, at a foundry right on the mm -hmm. on, on the factory floor. Mm -hmm. uh, that's what you when you're buying a project boat of any kind. 
hardware is the, what you're technically buying. I see. Uh, wood can be replaced, can be redone, but hardware is very, very difficult to yes. find and very, yes. very expensive to reproduce. Yeah. Just reproducing a, a, a bow light like this today would be, you know, cost inefficient in, in many ways, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Carl Riva was known to do uh, an extreme finish, you know, heavier plating, oh, nicer okay. polish. And well, you've got an original and a redone. Yes, yeah, yeah, so here. I have a piece here. Uh, you know, even after 60 years, uh, the, the plating looked better than you know yeah. l most new boats today. Right. Uh, um, but that's the difficult part in in 2022 is to find people who know how to plate. Yes. Uh, plating is plating. I think is the craft of polishing. Oh, okay. Uh, is is difficult. Yeah. You know, plating is a three-part operation, a four-part operation. Really, you mm -hmm. you deep plate the piece. Mm -hmm. um, right. You 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 uh, copper plate it. Yep. Then you polish it. Yeah. Then you copper plate it again, and then you nickel plate it. Okay. And in the end, the, the chrome will come on, and you know things can go wrong, and you have to start over again. And yeah. finding. Um, companies or suppliers to do this in a proper way is getting uh, it's getting difficult and certainly expensive right, very expensive right, right so you were fortunate enough to have the right hardware and find the right people to bring it back to life that's right and um, you know uh, we're standing in front of uh, the original windshield mm -hmm. um, of the 18 or so uh, early Rivas of Aristens of out today, mm -hmm. uh, one or two or three has its original windshield. Really? They wow. put plexiglass on just yeah. to reproduce the shape of window. Uh, today, it's you know twenty thousand dollars just for the windshield. So, so very important when you, if you want to start a restoring a wooden boat, make sure that you have the hardware and the correct hardware because. Many people substituted yes, with some other stuff years, over the years, yeah, yeah. yeah, and make sure that you have the right hardware and um, have the hardware, yeah. Um, yeah. which is a big part of the job. Yeah, it's beautiful. Thank you. It's uh, and again proportions. It's you know it has a siren. It has mm -hmm. uh, you know it everything sort of flows together. Right. Uh, very very nice mm -hmm. um, on on these boats. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This instrument panel on this boat, like many classic and vintage boats, is really an interesting one. Part of the interest is the parts seem to come from different places. For example, if we start with the steering wheel, was this a Riva steering wheel? It, uh, it's rebranded as the uh, Riva steering wheel okay. today, but it, it is actually an Alfa Romeo steering wheel, mm -hmm. uh, 1953 Alfa Romeo. And when we restored it, we know that because inside the hub is all, all the mechanics for a horn oh, is really? in yeah. place. That's so funny. he put a Riva logo in the center and called it Riva. Perfect. How about these other instruments here as we move across the dashboard? Yeah, so it's a, it's, it's a fuel gauge uh, first. Um, that was also rare in 1955 to oh, have a fuel gauge. Oh. They just had a fuel stick at the okay. time. Oh, right. It's the tachometer. Um, combination gauge here uh, mm -hmm. that is oil pressure and amps. Okay. And at the end here, it's an hour meter, and it's a Hobbs hour meter. Hobbs, it is yeah. Hobbs. It's very rare uh, yes. because it got the the the, the dials uh, in in the counting. Uh, all these gauges are professionally restored uh, out in the state of Washington. Mm -hmm. There's a few people uh, in um, in the country who can do this type mm -hmm. of work. Right. Uh, get the plating right, and you know, make them work right. Not the least, you mm -hmm. know, calibrate them mm -hmm. and so forth. Uh, it's fine to note that I have the original ignition oh. uh, of this one, and even the key has Riva uh, branded into the key. Nice. Uh, and you get the period correct. Uh, switch knobs. They okay. changed over time from oh. from from okay. 50s and. Later ah. on, they always changed mm -hmm. uh, the Formica dash, which is quite unique. That's a little unusual, yeah. It is, you know, most are mahogany exactly. uh, dashes. Yeah. Riva went to mahogany uh, dash as well, but not until, you know, uh, early 60s they mm -hmm. went to there. And mm -hmm. uh, Formica dash uh, is uh, reproduced, uh, the design and layout. And uh, Wilson Art has a custom shop there you can have a custom Formica mm -hmm. printed mm -hmm. and made today. Upholstery is really a key component of a classic wooden boat. Mm -hmm. uh, can you tell us a little bit about this, kind of where it started and where we are here now? Well, you know, um, 
Italians have been a leader in fashion from from the 40s and 50s. Yes. And you can see that in Arriva. It's uh, for Americans, it's quite a spectacular <laughs> color combination. Right. But this is it the is. original uh, uh, reproduction of the original upholstery. Mm -hmm. Have a sample here of the original uh, material, mm -hmm. uh, and it's been faithfully uh, reproduced in Italy. Wow. Uh, it's imported uh, from Italy mm -hmm. uh, and even the flooring as well. This is a piece of the original flooring and they reproduced the, uh, the, the, the looks on that into the flooring as well. And the feel, right. Yeah. How about, you know, a boat like this is, is nice enough to go to shows, get judged. Is that sort of thing important? It is very important. So um, in ACBS judging, um, the, the boat is judged upon itself from the day it left the factory. Yes. So it's not necessarily a first, second, and third in each class. It's based on the day the boat it's left the factory. Faithfulness to the original. Exactly. Model. Yep. And it's mm -hmm. the day it left, and they deduct everything that is not period correct. Yes. And so, in that manner, uh, having the correct upholstery with the correct design. Grain, uh, is and color. grain and color mm -hmm. is very, very important. Yes. Yeah, yep. yeah, that's neat. Yep. Well, this has an interesting feature to it too, right? So it's normally yep. people would use it just like we're using it here now. That's right. But um, Riva built in a little sun deck in the cockpit there. He built so he can lay the, the seat down uh -huh. and uh, you could uh, lay here and you could tan and, you know, <laughs> chat about the day. <laughs> right. Yeah, it's a nice, nice setup. It is a very nice setup, <laughs> very much so. <laughs> well, Bjorn, on these classic wooden speedboats, uh, of course, the power plant is a big deal because it's a power boat, it's a speedboat. You're yep. supposed to want to go fast. And That's that right. Thing. And um, these Rivas originally were powered with Italian engines, right? Italian engines. And in 1952, Carlo Riva, he, he traveled to the United States uh, to Chris Craft in Michigan mm -hmm. to uh, ask them to, to buy and use uh, Chris Craft engines uh, in his boats. Oh, okay. uh, he did get uh, the rights to that. Mm -hmm. um, there's a great stories about it. Uh, I don't have time about that <laughs> right, now, but there's right. yeah, great stories about it. Uh, this uh, boat has a Chris Craft engine. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a model MBL, 158 horsepower. Okay. Uh, basically, is a stock uh, MBL with uh. some Riva bolt-ons uh, oh. that he put in. He put in some uh, special what? engine wedges. Okay. Uh, Water-cooled exhaust uh, okay. manifolds. Yeah. Uh, and an oil filter as well, which is not standard on uh, on uh, Chris Craft oh, okay. uh, of the time. Yes. All right. Yeah. All right. Yeah. It um, and again, many people are surprised to see uh, that it's a Chris Craft yes, engine. Yes. 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 Uh, they're very surprised to see Riva Chris Craft emblem in the dash. Right. Uh, and Chris Craft gauges uh, that we looked at earlier, but right. that came as a packet. Right. And uh, these early American engines, whether they were sixes or eights, that's really right. delivered a lot of torque for that's their right. size. Right. Lot of torque, low RPM. Uh, Fifty-five is pre uh, V8 days okay. for boats. Uh, so it is a flathead six okay. uh, to 340 some cubic inch. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, got, it got a lot of power to, to, to move a 20, 21 foot boat yeah. uh, of the time. Uh, it is uh, reliable, uh, though parts are getting harder and harder to find, mm -hmm. uh, especially the wet parts, uh, manifolds yes. and stuff like that. So, mm -hmm. so we are careful to keep it in fresh water. Um, just example, just to get a manifold now, if you can find one, it's uh, anywhere from 2000 to three and a half thousand dollars. All right, yeah, you don't want to go down that road if you don't have to, but it's Certainly. a nice, nice balanced power plant for a boat like this. It, it is, and it uh, moves it quite well. Um, this boat is so new, I'm still in a break in uh, period on this. So, uh, but you know, back in the day, they did uh, 40 miles in the day, and, mm -hmm. uh, and you can easily pull skiers uh, yeah. of a boat like this. And, um, you know, that's, uh, that's a reliability about uh, high torque, low RPM, uh, American steel. Yeah, does the job. Does the job. Yeah. Well, Bjorn, it's tough to believe, but uh, time to wrap up the show for today. Yeah. And uh, we've covered a lot of ground um, from the, you know, the whole hobby and yeah. uh, 
pursuit of restoring classic wooden boats. To, before we close out, is there anything else you'd like to say? I would like to just thank you for uh, thinking of uh, reporting on classic boating, resta boat restoration and vintage boating. Um, and if anybody of your viewers are interested in vintage boating, they can look up um, Antique and Classic Boat Society at acbs.org. Wealth of information, uh, 52 chapters around the country and in Canada. And um, help is uh, out there for people who want to restore and use their vintage craft. Beautiful. Yeah. Great. Thank you, Smart Boating viewers, for joining us. If you have comments, questions, or just want to watch another show, come to us at www.smartboatingus.com. Thank you.